earth. Yes. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. First lesson is from Genesis 50, 15 to 21, a reading from the book of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, 
and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from Paul's letter to the Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord, and also, and those who, also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, 
As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory be to thee, O Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, the one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and he could not pay. His Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions and payment, be to, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. 
Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. Please be seated. The more life experience I gain, the more assured I become that forgiveness is critical to a well-lived life. I don't say that lightly or from a vantage point of success. I say it because of experiences, both mine and those of others, who have struggled and wrestled and fought forgiveness throughout their entire lives. Forgiveness is the act of forgiving. And the verb to forgive is defined by Merriam-Webster as to cease feeling resentment against or in terms of a debt owed to pardon or cancel. When someone has wronged us in either large or small ways, to forgive them is to let go of the pain they have caused us in a manner that potentially reconciles the relationship, or at least releases the emotional debt one from another. To not forgive, however, is a seed of bitterness sowed within our own souls that will faithfully grow, gradually preventing us from living our best, fullest, Christ-centered lives. I can't really emphasize strongly enough how vital forgiveness is to our faith, to our life. I can also attest from my own life and those stories shared with me that forgiveness is one of the hardest things to do especially when you've been truly wronged or when unforgiveness somehow gives us an edge over the other. Our Thursday morning prayer and Bible study group is reading C.S. Lewis's fictional book entitled The Great Divorce. A short book and a quick read from cover to cover, the book itself is chock full of symbolism with many characters that remind us of people we've known in our lives. The book begins in hell, a gloomy, dim place where everything wanted or needed is simply available by a thought or a desire of making it so. The twist, however, is that the items brought into being never quite fill the desire or need that they're asked of such as houses with leaky roofs or food that looks but does not taste good. The premise of the book is an opportunity for the characters to take a bus to heaven where, given the right circumstances, they may choose to stay there in that perfect place rather than returning to hell. During this journey and decision-making process, curious insights are shared with us about people who may know what is best for them and how glorious that decision could be. And yet they chose and choose over and over again to remain in hell. Perhaps we might call it their own personal self-inflicted hell. Now the tie-in to our sermon this morning is a question that we discussed at length on Thursday, and it's phrased something like this. Do you think some people don't want to be healed and would rather remain a victim of their circumstances? 
We can certainly extend this question to be phrased to include people who don't want to forgive and would rather hold on to that pain or on to that grudge. It's a really tough question, there's no doubt. During our conversation, we acknowledged that we each knew people who preferred to live into their victim identity rather than to make decisions to improve their circumstances or to forgive and begin again. I have realized in my own life, from both hours of prayer and hours of therapy, that when I withhold my forgiveness, I am hurting not only myself, but those around me that may have had nothing to do with the circumstance needing forgiveness. Painfully, I have also realized that there's a part of me that thinks that if I withhold forgiveness, that if I hang on to the wrong that's been inflicted on me, to my victim status, it gives me a sense of power over the offender. Learning that, acknowledging that, and saying it out loud to you here from the pulpit is no easy task. If I look like I'm squirming, I am. And when I'm really, really not at my best, I might use that power to my advantage by bending the offender's will to mine. It's an ugly but real aspect of my personality, and one of which I must be constantly vigilant and perpetually in prayer. I think, though, if we're honest with ourselves, I might not be the only person who finds this within themselves. So we need to pay attention when forgiveness rises up to challenge us, not just for our own good and not just because Jesus himself commanded it as a fundamental aspect of our Christian faith. When Peter asks in the gospel passage this morning, in my opinion, in a rather tongue-in-cheek as the phrase goes sort of way, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? I can't help but think that perhaps Peter thinks seven times is a huge number of forgivenesses. And perhaps he even expected Jesus to say, no, not that many times. But Jesus doesn't. He says as many as 77 times, which for us really means as many times as they ask for or need forgiveness. That's a rather tall order now, don't you think? When we look at forgiveness from the perspective of being hurt or offended, we quickly become weary of the thought of being harmed over and over again. But when we look at forgiveness from the side of someone who is trying their best and repeatedly fails despite honest efforts, forgiveness sure feels like it should be freer flowing, don't you think? I mean, how many hundreds, thousands, perhaps even millions of times have each of us ourselves broken the commandments of our faith? How many times have we not loved our neighbor as ourselves, not put Jesus first, and yet still been forgiven by our Savior? Forgiveness was first given to us unconditionally by God and a gift so immense, so encompassing, that we can't even begin to comprehend it. <clears throat> when this example is set before us, how can we then withhold our forgiveness from others? It's a thought that brings me to my knees in prayer over and over. Now I pause here to acknowledge a very, very important footnote. And you probably already know this, but it needs to be said. Not all people in this world are good. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, one in three women and one in four men are victims of domestic abuse. The statistics on child abuse are even scarier. So please hear me when I say there is a difference between forgiveness and allowing oneself or a loved one to remain in a harmful situation. No one should be repeatedly harmed physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We can, perhaps, forgive the offender while simultaneously removing the opportunity for repeat offenses. 
After Peter's question about how many times to forgive, Jesus goes on to tell the parable of the king who forgives a huge debt to one of his slaves. We understand the forgiveness of this king to the slave to be nearly immeasurable. It was 10,000 talents. But then in a sad twist, that same slave who has been forgiven refuses to forgive someone who owes him a comparably small debt and even punishes him to the extent of the law. I think the irony is very obvious to us from a distance. How could this slave not share the wealth of his own forgiveness with others? What a wretched soul. But then, however, if you're like me, the reality of the parable sinks in slowly and painfully as we realize we are also this wretched slave. We have been given the most amazing gift of forgiveness, forgiveness from all our sins and from our human selfish behavior. Why then can't we also forgive others of theirs, regardless of whether they ask or not? regardless of whether they deserve it or not. The gift was free to us, and yet we too often share it so stingily. Friends, I'm not standing in this pulpit in any way indicating that forgiveness is easy or that I have conquered the concept of it. I believe wholeheartedly most all of us will go to our deathbeds still struggling with forgiveness. However, I will remind us that this gift freely given to us is one that we must faithfully continue to give to others as well. Withholding it, using it to our advantage, and wallowing in it is not what Christ commanded us to do. We don't want those seeds of bitterness planted in our beautiful souls to grow. I am blessed with many wise Christian counselors, therapists, and friends. And in a recent therapy session, it was suggested to me that I practice the concept of undo. That's U-N-D-O, as in to undo something. For those of us familiar with word processing applications or email, you'll note that there's usually a button somewhere on the page that you click, it's often a back arrow, that will undo something that you've typed or done. It doesn't argue about it with you, it doesn't ask for your forgiveness, it just undoes what was done. With God's help, a quick undo, a quick forgiveness of a wrong received throws out that seed of bitterness before it can take root. I have found this concept very difficult, but also very promising. Note to all you out there, if you see me saying undo, 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 under my breath, you better think about what you just said to me. (laughs) Perhaps, though, if I can begin undoing more quickly, forgiving those offenses and even larger ones will become easier. Practice makes it easier. I know every time so far that I thought this would make an excellent undo, I have found myself challenged in arguing with myself about whether to apply it or not. And yet, I won't give up. I'll keep trying. Because while I may never completely conquer forgiving the other, I will never stop trying to do so. I pray for the same for every single one of us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son of God, begotten his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, heir of God of heir of God, begotten of me, being with one substance with the Father, by the who for us men are salvation. 
pray for the whole state of Christ Church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Doug, our bishop, Michelle, our priest, and Debbie, our priest that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Lord, in thy mercy. Amen. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy, we beseech thee also to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this land, in this and every land, especially Joe, our president, Eric, our governor, and Tom, our mayor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Lord, in thy mercy, Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Lord, in thy mercy, we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all immigrants, refugees, and prisoners, and all those who in the this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We pray for the healing for Patty, Anne, Mary Jo, Eileen, John, Jack, Tom, Sally, Marilyn, Dan, Baby Humphrey, Anne, Mary, Alda, Gordy, Tom, Lauren, Barb, and Doris. Lord, in thy mercy. Yeah. Yeah. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee that to grant them most continual growth in thy love and service and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of the ever-blessed ever Virgin Mary, St. Paul, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, guide the nations of the world into the way of justice and truth, and establish them among them that peace which is the fruit of righteousness that they may become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, in thy mercy.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. Let us see what we have. It says we have no birthdays this week. Anyone have a birthday that's not listed here? Okay, we have two anniversaries, Clyde and Jessica Kraft, and Dan and Lynn. I don't know how to pronounce their last name, so I'm not. Greeno? Okay, Dan and Lynn Greeno. So, let us pray. O oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it it is represented that in it is represented the spiritual unity between, between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon these, your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated for a couple of announcements. First and foremost, huge thanks to everyone who had any part whatsoever in the Sunflower Fair yesterday. Uh, whether you just prayed for us or you were here all day or you made cookies or you gave tours, thank you for um, helping us to have the church open. Uh, we had a lot of people walk through the church. A lot of people received beautiful tours of, of our stained glass windows and there was a lot of pop corn and cookies given out. So it's one way that we can very easily be present to the community because it's right here in our front backyard, whatever you would call that. So thank you for that. If you're on Vestry, we're meeting today after church at about 1045 and we'll go ahead and meet in the parish hall. Don't forget the community dinner is this Tuesday evening and all the food items are signed up for. So all you have to do is bring an item you've signed up for or just bring yourself and come and eat. Um, don't forget, please, that Saturday is the Requiem Eucharist for our beloved Winnie Eirich. Uh, visitation will begin at 10 a.m. I know that all four of the children will be here and most all of the grandchildren and great-grands. Uh, and the Eucharist itself will begin at 11 a.m. There will be no tra uh, traveling to the graveside because she will be interred with her husband, Father Eirich, on Martha's Vineyard. And... Don't forget to remind everybody about the First Friday concert because the First Friday is coming up fast again. Thank you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute in his holy gospel, command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice, until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of the almighty goodness, vouchsafe to bless 
and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and may be one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord.
almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee. Feed us in these holy mysteries, spiritual food, this body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And thus assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us and that we are very members and corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of the everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in thy holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom we and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, for the world without end. Amen. The peace of God, which passes, passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world, 